Our next lecture will be given by Johnny Burtka, who is the president and CEO of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He graduated from Hillsdale College with degrees in French and Christian studies and earned a graduate degree in theology from La Faculté Jean Calvin in France. And he will correct me since I pronounced that correct, <laughs> incorrectly. Uh, Johnny began his career at ISI where he served as a development officer. He returned to ISI after four years at the American Conservative Magazine where he served as executive director and acting editor. Johnny has appeared on Fox News and Fox Business and written for the Washington Post, the Richmond Times-Dispatch, First Things, The American Mind, and the Intercollegiate Review, among other publications. He has been a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute and has participated in academic fellowships at Washington College and the Trinity Forum. Johnny lives in Pennsylvania with his wife, Amanda. Today, he will be giving a lecture entitled, Wokeness or Greatness? A Classical Approach to Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Johnny Burka. Thanks, Johnny. <clears throat> Thank you, Elizabeth. It's, <clears throat> it's wonderful to be with you here uh, this afternoon, and I'm hoping that my talk can be a little bit more practical. It's good to have the theory, uh, but I also think it's important to have some concrete uh, tangibles that you can take home with you and implement on your campus. Americans are disappointed in our leaders. A recent poll from NBC News said that 72% of Americans, doesn't matter what party, believe that the country is headed in the wrong direction. 70% believe that we have irreconcilable differences among us that will only continue to grow, right? This affirms Josh Mitchell's thesis last night that our problems are gonna get a lot worse before they begin to get better. Our president uh, of the United States has an approval rating of 42%. It's about the same approval rating that Donald Trump had for most of his presidency. And Congress's approval is a dismal 18%. The left controls the commanding heights of society from the academy to Silicon Valley to the federal, to the federal bureaucracy. They are largely corrupt, immoral, and out of touch with the interests of ordinary Americans. The right controls Florida, Texas, and Virginia. And while better than the left, uh, with few exceptions, especially in the leadership levels of the Republican Party, is largely incompetent, ignorant, and lacking in vision. There are manifold examples that I could give about how our leaders are failing, whether it's crime or the COVID lockdowns or wokeness, but I won't uh, belabor you with those details because you already know everything that's going wrong in the country right now and Josh did a good job last night diagnosing the illness. Today I will focus on, practically speaking, how can we go about curing uh, the crisis of leadership that we faced in America. And to do that first, we must make a choice, wokeness or greatness. We can only pick one of the two. Wokeness says that the past is oppression, therefore we must reject it. Greatness says that the past has much oppression in it, but we must learn from it. We must study the example of great men and women who have done beautiful and good things in their lives, in their communities, and for their country. Uh, or men and women who maybe didn't do many beautiful things, but at least mitigated the bad that they experienced during the context of their life. So how do we learn from the past? Well, the secret that I'll let you in on is that we are not the first people to have bad leaders. We're not the first people to have bad leaders. In fact, if you, especially if you dive more into to biographies and histories, which I'll talk about more later, you'll see that most leaders for most of time have either been mediocre or terrible. And there's actually an entire genre of literature, which we'll talk about, that was designed to help fix this problem. And that genre of literature is called the mirror for princes genre for literature. And basically what these are is they're short leadership manuals uh, one of them is described as an elegant, survival an elegant survival manual for an embattled emperor. And typically, they're about one to 200 pages long. And when you have a new king or queen, uh, there is often a philosopher who also has practical experience with statecraft. And he'll write the manual. He'll dedicate it to the new king or queen and hand it to them and basically offer his services uh, to the new, to the new uh, leader. Uh, often the person writing this manual gets killed. Uh, it's normally, 
not until several generations later, and, and in some cases several centuries or even millennium later, that leaders really take the wisdom to heart. And some of them have pr been presented, uh, for example, the, the one written by Agapetus the deacon to Justinian uh, in the Byzantine Empire. You know, this was popular between the year 600 all the way to the year 1600. And when Queen Victoria, as well as Ivan the Terrible, ascended to the throne, they were presented a copy of this manual. Uh, some of the, the famous uh, authors in this genre include Xenophon, who wrote uh, The Education of Cyrus the Great. You have Cicero's On Duties. Uh, you also have, you know, these texts appear pretty much in every civilization, every religion, from ancient China to ancient Israel to, uh, to Islam. And uh, some of the other texts, Han Fei uh, is the Chinese leader, Agapetus the deacon, uh, Machiavelli, especially during the Renaissance, there was a recovery of many of these texts. So you have Machiavelli, Erasmus, and Thomas More all discovering them. And perhaps one of the most profound insights is from uh, one of the oldest texts, Xenophon Cyrus the Great. And he's asking the question of, you know, what do we do? There's so many bad leaders around. Um, he says, it doesn't have to be this way. He says, quote, ruling human beings does not belong among those tasks that are impossible, or even among those that are difficult, if one does it with knowledge. So he locates the, the solution to this political problem in knowledge. He does the same thing. Um, he does the same thing that, um, sorry, I'm blanking, Alexander Hamilton did. The problem to this political problem is in knowledge. And his case in point is Cyrus the Great, who knew what he needed to know practically and theoretically. And he built an empire, and he ruled well, and his, uh, his people loved him in return. So the proven solution that we've seen time and time again is educating and mentoring future leaders with the knowledge, practical and theoretical, that's needed to renew the nation. Uh, this was brought up last night with the example of the Jews in ancient, ancient Israel. There was always a remnant, and, and things would get really bad. The king would bring in all sorts of idols. The people would go astray. But a small group would band together, and they would educate the leaders they needed to save the country. So today, what I'm going to provide for you are very practical insights from this Mirror for Princes genre uh, to equip you to become the leaders that America needs. Now, I'll say this, I'm 31 years old, I'm about 10 years older than most of you, uh, so a lot of the things that, that I'm sharing with you are also aspirational for, for myself. Uh, I'm sure you could ask either my wife or my coworkers, and they'll tell you that I, I do not perfectly embody these virtues, but these are things that have helped me along the way and that I think that can uh, help you as well. All right, rule number one, mentors. Stay close with your mentors always. This is a point Elizabeth, I think, brought up very well when she said, pick one mentor and stick with one. And it's important for a few reasons to have good mentors. The first is you're going to encounter problems as a student with your friends. You're going to encounter problems with your professors. Uh, that your friends and professors aren't going to be able to answer. You need someone like a Jeff Paulette who's been in the trenches working with students for the past 20, 30 years who can help give you the wisdom that you need. This is even more important uh, as you graduate from college and go throughout your career. So obviously some mentors come in and out of your life, but I would highly recommend that you stay in touch with them. Even if it's not, uh, you're not, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're not talking to them on the phone all the time, but even if once a year you send them an email and say, hey, this is what I'm up to, these are the people who will open the doors that will change your life later. One example in my own life is Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale College. I was on the, a Zoom call with him for an hour, and he said, Johnny, he just kind of paused and said, Johnny, you know, how many students do you think I have had over the last 20 years? I said, I don't know. He said, well, maybe 3,000. And I, and I said, okay. And he said, how many do you think stay in touch with me? And he said, 30. About 30 students out of the 3,000 stay in touch with me. And he said, well, how many do I do Zoom calls with for an hour every few months? And he said, you're the only one, right? You're the only one, right? And it was, it was Dr. Arn who both times was instrumental in helping me get the job at ISI. And so if you stay close to the right people, it will, it will reap benefits throughout your, your whole life. And a corollary to this uh, is also stay close to your friends, right? You're, you're probably only going to be able to stay close to one or two friends throughout your whole life. You might have a dozen close buddies in college. Most of them are going to fade away. But you want one or two who can give you honest feedback when no one else will. Cyrus says, sorry, um, Cyrus the Great says, quote, this golden scepter 
is not what preserves kingship. Rather, trustworthy friends are the truest and safest scepter for kings. It's, it's, it's especially true the higher you climb up the ladder, the less you can trust people because the more people uh, want to become your friend for what you can bestow back to them as a gift. So it's very important that you have these friendships to guide you along the way. Number two, uh, credibility can be transferred by association. Credibility can be transferred by association. Cicero says, the easiest and most desirable way of gaining recognition is followed by young men who seek the company of the famous and wise. If they often appear in the company of these men, they give folks the impression that they will turn out like those whom they have chosen as their models, right? So start hanging around the people that you want to become. And this principle of credibility can be transferred through association. Uh, one very concrete example of this is in development. So ISI is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we raise money from you know, individual donors to support our mission. And you might take Ethan, for example. He was an ISI student. He's probably 25, 26 years old. And Ethan, say, reaches out to someone who's a billionaire because he wants to tell them about ISI. Well, do you think if, if they receive an email from Ethan, as wonderful as he is, that they're going to randomly want to meet with a guy named Ethan Swain from Wilmington, Delaware? Probably not, right? But in his email, Ethan says, my name's Ethan Swain, all right? I'm from the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. We were founded in 1953 by William F. Buckley, Jr. Okay, so all of a sudden you see the credibility of ISI as an institution, the credibility of William F. Buckley, Jr is being transferred to Ethan, and he's no longer Ethan Swain, he's an ambassador of ISI, right? You can push it even farther if you have a board member like a Larry Arn or like an Ed Fulner, who is president of the Heritage Foundation, who, who, who he can also in that email say, and guess what, Larry Arn told me I should reach out to you. All of a sudden, if they know and respect Larry Arn, you know, that'll help him get the foot in the door. So all of this, you know, my whole life, I have always, like, any interesting thinker or speaker or public figure, since the time I was 22 years old, I always, like, had someone who knew them help reach out, or I would name drop this person and just try to meet with them and get coffee with them and just ask them, like, a dozen questions and then leave, you know, and then stay in touch with them. And these people ended up circling back into my life later on. Uh, point number three, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. The funny thing about that, it sounds like a modern cliche, but this is one thing that appears over and over again in the Mirror for Princes genre. So much so that Cicero described it as a shortcut to greatness. A shortcut to greatness. And he's, he's citing Socrates, who was the original pioneer of this concept. He says, it's true that Socrates declared the nearest path to glory was by taking the shortcut, so to say, of behaving in such a way as to be the kind of person you would like to become, All right? So you start acting like the person you want to become, all of a sudden other people will start seeing you as the person you want to, you'll want to become, and then you will actually become that person. Uh, but that's the fastest way to get there. Some, one of my good friends told me that she's never taken a job that she knows how to do. She's never taken a job that she knows how to do. She sells, you know, sells herself on her competence, her enthusiasm. She gets the job. And then once she gets the job, she watches YouTube videos. She does Googling. She learns how to do the skills that she needs. And I think you'll find, as you do that in your own careers, you're not going to have your dream job right out of college. But you'll find that your career development is an exercise in creative problem solving. Right? You'll get in a job and you'll immediately learn there are things that I'm good at, there are things that I'm bad at. Uh, and, and really the secret to success is harnessing those things that you're good at and finding other people to do the things that you are bad at. Number four, study and imitate great men and great women. Machiavelli says, a prudent man should always enter upon the paths beaten by great men and imitate those who have been most excellent so that even if his own virtue does not reach that far, it is at least in the odor of it. So you see again here this imitation, uh, all of a sudden people begin to, to associate you with, like, with the people that you're imitating. And I, I, very practically speaking, I'd recommend listening or reading biographies of great leaders. And when you listen to them, 
I would listen to them with the aim of becoming the people that you're listening to. Some people just like to listen to history because they're history buffs. I say read history to become the actors in history. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because you can actually see if you're 18 years old, if you're 22 years old, you can see yourself in each stage of a leader's life as they develop. And this would be true of not only these more theoretical skills, but also more hard, concrete skills as well. Whether it's writing, you want to become a good writer, start reading good writers. Public speaking, there are other trades and crafts uh, for whom this principle is true as well. Number five, rule thyself. Rule thyself. This was from uh, an Islamic text, uh, and I would butcher the name if I try to pronounce it, uh, Abu Yahi Ibn al-Batik. And he, he says, for the most sovereign wisdom and virtue that a king can have is to rule himself wisely. This is President Xenophon. Xenophon says that restraint is a feast. Uh, basically, it's the principle that if gratification comes, if it's, if it's delayed. And, you know, there, there's, there's no example of someone who indulges in the appetites of the flesh, the addictions of the flesh, who it doesn't come to ruin them later on. So you need to learn how to be a master of yourself. Uh, for me, this has really stood out reading uh, a biography of the, the Russian czars and czarinas. And the thing that really uh, stood out to me is that the, uh, the czars uh, had an excessive amount of extramarital affairs. Right? They were always having an affair, no matter how pious they pretended to be. And someone, you might say, from a worldly perspective, well, what's, what's the big deal? They're the czar. They're an autocrat. They can do whatever they want. They're never going to lose their job. You know, how could it, besides ruining their marriage, which it does, you know, how could this actually hurt their leadership? And, and what was most striking to me is reading their journals, their personal journals. And in reading them, you see that they have the emotional development, even at the age of 60 years old, of a 15 or 16-year-old boy. Because what they do is they go through their entire life with infatuation after infatuation having these crushes, right? And every 9 or 12 months, they have a new mistress. And it totally wrecks everything. I mean, they're leaving meetings early to run and, and <laughs> visit with their mistresses. And they do this over and over again. And it, you literally see the deformation of their soul because of their choices, even if they're untouchable. So uh, whether or not you're, you're pious and self-restrained for religious reasons or just because you want to be a great person, whether you're a pagan or a Christian, restraint pays off in the long run. Number six, conquering is easier than ruling. Cyrus the Great said, it is a great work to gain an empire, but an even much greater work to keep one safe after taking it. It's largely self-explanatory, but I would say that the key to ruling after conquering is that personnel is policy, and so having the right people around you will make that ruling easier. Number seven, find your niche, own it, and delegate the rest. Cicero says, we must therefore work hardest at the things for which we are best suited. So this is the, the principle that I think is, is, is very valuable. I mentioned it earlier. You only have a limited amount of time to work on your skills. So if you have three hours of spare time, you'll have to make a choice. Do I devote that time to something that I'm really good at, or do I devote those three hours to improving an area where I'm weak? And if you, sometimes you have to do both, especially if your job requires you to do things that you're not maybe naturally suited for. But if you have a choice, spend that three hours on your strengths. And what you'll see is if you spend it on your strengths, you'll go from here to here. But if you spend it on your weaknesses, you'll go from here to here. And so it's through your strengths that you will then open up opportunities and you'll become, in your place of employment, the one person who's really good at doing a specific thing and then as you climb the ladder, you'll have people who you can actually then delegate the things that you're not good at to. Number eight, uh, if everyone loves you, something might be wrong. If everyone hates you, you're probably being an asshole. Aristotle's politics are, says there are two things which especially undermine government, hatred and contempt. It's really hard to be a ruler if you have the contempt of your people. I think. One of the reasons that you saw someone like uh, Donald Trump uh, very much struggle, right, and even fail in, in certain respects in his presidency is because there, there was too much contempt for him, right? You can, you can win 
and have the contempt of the elites but the support of 70, 80% of the people. Or you can have the contempt of the people but the support of the elites. But if you don't have uh, a solid majority in one of those camps, it is very difficult to actually get anything done. Number nine, be the person who shows up with a solution or a plan to find a solution. It's, it's very easy. Everyone knows there's, all, there's always all sorts of problems. You'll encounter problems every week in your life. It's, it's not particularly helpful to be someone who commiserates in the problems going on. Everyone sees what they are. Be the person who either shows up with a plan to fix the problem or, or who shows up and says, I have a plan to come up with a plan to fix the problem. Number 10, uh, when you mess up at work or in life, give a simple apology. Don't mention excuses or provide a lengthy explanation. Thomas Jefferson says the most valuable of all talents is that of never using two words when one will do. Number 11, don't avoid conflict or it compounds. Machiavelli says one never seeks to avoid one inconvenience without running into another. I can tell you, you know, from my own life, you know, whether it's in work or your personal life, there's never been a situation where there's some sort of conflict or some tension, and by delaying bringing it up and addressing it, the situation improves. The situation always gets worse, and then the, it's always a harder conversation, and the problem always blows up even more. So basically, but it's hard to bring it up because it's uncomfortable to bring things up immediately, so you just have to develop the habit of doing it, and the more that you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, reject the, I'm sorry, number 13, never let money be an obstacle to pursuing a bold dream. There, there is an abundance of money in the world. There's much, uh, much fewer people have good ideas and much fewer are uh, actually good people. So if you're a good person who has a good idea, uh, there are people that are willing to fund your idea, whether it's a business venture, whether it's a nonprofit organization, uh, just do not, money is one of the easy, easiest obstacles to overcome in life if, you have, if, you're a, if you're an ambitious person with the right ideas and you've made some connections. Number 14, reject the I'm not smart enough to do what he or she did mentality. Uh, there's nothing more antithetical to greatness than to look upon yourself. It, you'll look upon yourself and you can see your deficiencies, but you shouldn't let your deficiencies define you, right? I'm personally rarely the smartest person in the room, especially around all these ISI professors and speakers. You can know when you're talking to someone, right, if their brain is just operating at a higher level. And you should just marvel at that. You shouldn't let that be something that impedes you from pursuing your goal. And plus, if you're, if you're already in this room, that means you can hold your own with most people in most places. Number 15, enthusiasm over expertise. Xenophon says, battles are decided more by souls than the robustness of bodies. He goes on, tactics are a small part of generalship. Enthusiasm makes all the difference. Expertise is important. You need people who know how to do immensely practical things, but as a leader, the difference between defeat and victory is actually being able to have enthusiasm and inspire the people that are serv serving under you. Number 16, confidence is contagious, but fear even more. Cyrus the Great says, large masses of human beings, when they are confident, offer an irresistible spirit, yet whenever they grow afraid, to the extent that they are more numerous, so much greater is their terror and its impact. So fear is even more contagious uh, than uh, sorry, then, then courage and confidence. So it's important to, to cultivate uh, the former and to rid uh, fear. As, as, if it, as soon as you see it starting, starting to spread, you have to cut it off. Number 17, momentum is everything. There, there, momentum is everything. So there, there's an interplay with many of these great leaders where you see the interplay of their own virtues but also fortune or providence, and maybe fortune is different than providence, that's something we could talk about separately. But there's a lot of great leaders who, if they were born 20 years earlier or 20 years later, we would literally not know who they are today. So there's this intersection between virtue and the opportunity, the wave that comes that you have to ride. And I would say, at certain parts in your life, the wind will be at your back, and at other parts in your life, it'll be blowing in your face. 
And you can work just as hard in both times and you'll get really far in one spot and you won't make any progress in another. So I would say when the wind is at your back, run as fast as you can, down, move the ball down the field as fast as you can. Number 18, uh, strike where your enemy is the weakest. Uh, ide ideology often blinds your enemies uh, to their own weaknesses. And so this is, you know, it's just a battle tactic if you're going back to, you know, classical battles. Identifying, you know, it's very rare to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a powerful foe and beat them on your merits, especially if you're a small and scrappy band of brothers like so many conservatives are on college campuses. So it's important that you identify the areas uh, where your opponent is weak, that you strike a quick and decisive victory in a small battle, and that you use that momentum uh, to then win another. Uh, but it always begins by striking where the enemy is the, weak, the weakest. Number 19, uh, never punch down. Never punch down. So Aristotle says you should be high-handed towards those in high station, moderate towards those in a middle station, but it is bad form to act tough towards the weak. You see this in a Christian context with Christ who excoriates the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but who shows mercy to the tax collector uh, and the prostitutes. Next point, never burn a bridge unless it's absolutely necessary. Never burn a bridge unless it's absolutely necessary. This is hard, harder in the world of Twitter where we respond very ferociously and quickly uh, to what other people say. Uh, but it's important, especially as conservatives, because in this world, th this world is very small, right? And there's people who you're working with today who you think, well, I'm never going to see them again in my life. But five or ten years back down the road, they circle back. So, you know, if you really feel like you need to burn a bridge, um, I would think about sleep on it. Uh, and preferably, you'll take this to them individually off the record uh, before taking it into a more public forum. Number 21, uh, champion the lowly. You see this throughout uh, the Mirror for Princes genre. Uh, it's not only the right thing to do, it's also good politics to be a defender of those who are weak and oppressed. Uh, Gopidas writes to Justinian, and he, he, paraphrasing here, he says, the loftiness of a king means he is particularly equipped to reach down and to touch the lives of the most lowly and to lift them up. Number 22, cut the negativity. Cyrus the Great, a household falters less when it lacks servants than when it is confused by unjust ones. So you should be fair, you should give objective standards, right, to those that are on your team, but if someone is, has a spirit of negativity, so that that is what they sow, division and dissension in others, uh, you just, you have to cut it off, right? It's, you're never, they're, ne they're never going to improve, and it's better to be short-staffed than it is to have those types of people on board. Number 23, piety is primordial, and it is a good insurance policy. So what I mean by that is man is fundamentally a worshiping being, and when we order our lives around true religion, others follow along. You see this example embodied by someone like George Washington, right? His Thanksgiving Day uh, proclamation. John Adams also had them. Abraham Lincoln there's a way in which, without being ostentatious or trying to lord over their spirituality, they recognize as a matter of duty uh, the, the debt that they owe to God. They implore his blessings. And then once they're done, they go about their business. Uh, but that type of behavior is contagious. And Xenophon, uh, in particular, Cyrus the Great, cultivated that uh, as an insurance policy because he reasoned that if his partners around him were all pious, they'd be less likely to do something stupid, both concerning each other and concerning himself. So he, he did it, you know, maybe a little bit cynically uh, to, to have his back covered, but there are good um, religious reasons to do that as well. Number 25, be a realist. Uh, here's what I mean by that. A couple of things. The first thing I'll say is there's no shame in choosing the active life over the contemplative life. I remember being a student at Hillsdale and agonizing. You're around all these brilliant professors, and you think, you know, do, you know, am I called to spend my entire life devoted to the life of the mind, studying great ideas? Um, and I think there's there's probably a few people in this room who will do that. And I say, so I can help you. It will even help fund you, whether you want to be a journalist or a professor. But I would say that most people end up um, in the practical life, and there's no shame in that. And Cicero actually thought it was a greater duty. Uh, 
it, that it was your duty to devote yourself to the life of the polis first and foremost, and only then later uh, when you have spare time, whether it's you're in your retirement or whether you're exiled, uh, to devote to uh, leisure and to the life of the mind. Uh, one example I think we should hold up as a model of imitation would be Thomas More. Uh, Thomas More, in his book Utopia, uh, gets into a conversation with a, a traveler named Raphael, and he tells Raphael, you know, you're, you're so wise, you've been all over the world, you should really enter the service of a king. You'd be a wonderful counselor. And Raphael uh, says, you know, I would never be a counselor for a king uh, because I would have to compromise my moral virtue. I'd have to sit around uh, a group of flatterers, and uh, half the time I'd have to accept a bunch of stuff I don't agree with, and I'd basically sully myself and get myself dirty. And Thomas More says, you're thinking about this the wrong way. And there's a quote from Thomas More. It's a little long, but I'm going to read it to you because I think it really summarizes uh, the approach that we ought to have in our active life. Thomas More says, go through the drama in hand as best you can and don't spoil it all simply because you happen to think another drama would be better. That's how things go in the Council of Princes and in the Commonwealth. If you cannot pluck up a bad idea by the root, if you cannot cure long-standing evils as completely as you would like, you must not therefore abandon the commonwealth. Don't give up a ship in a storm because you cannot direct the winds. Don't arrogantly force strange ideas on people who you know have set their minds on a different course from yours. You must strive to influence policy indirectly, handle the situation tactfully, and thus what you cannot turn to good you may at least make as little bad as possible. For it is impossible to make everything good unless you make all men good, and I do not expect to see this for a very long time to come. Thomas More, of course, in his own life, offered his services to Henry VIII. Uh, he was a faithful counselor and minister, and then the time came when he was forced to choose between, uh, to swear an oath, right, to... Um, uh, acknowledge Henry as the, king, the head of the church, which he couldn't do because he was a Catholic. And so he served up to the very end, and his last words were that he, he died, I died the king's good servant, but God's first. And then he lost his head, right? And so he's one of these examples of the, the mirror for Prince John or who ends up dying, but then the legacy that he gives to us uh, ends up enduring for centuries to come. Number 26, don't ex expect rulers to be saints. Don't expect rulers to be saints. We want to have good rulers, that's the whole point of this talk, but most rulers aren't actually good people. And uh, the, it's really the Chinese uh, wisdom tradition, Han Fei, that points to this, saying it's stupid to demand that a ruler rise to the level of Confucius. Uh, such a policy is bound to fail, right? He says Confucius submitted himself to rulers who are far less virtuous than him. And so I, this just gets back to the old idea, don't put your trust in princes. We want them to be good, but nine times out of ten, they're going to disappoint you. Number 27, speak with simplicity. Han Fei, subtle and mysterious words are no business of the people. Right? If you want to be persuasive, you really, you, you really want to try to get in the head of the people that you're listening to. Uh, Han Fei goes on and says that the challenge of persuasion is not stating your case logically and eloquently. Anyone can learn to be a logical and an eloquent speaker, right? The challenge is, uh, quote, the difficult thing about persuasion is to know the mind of the person one is trying to persuade and to be able to fit one's words into it. Number 28, resist flattery and build a council of advisors. This is pretty much universal in all the uh, Mirror for Prince's literature. And this is very important. Uh, the reason that flattery is dangerous uh, is because it works. It is highly, highly effective, right? It's one of the most potent weapons known to mankind. Uh, what, what, what's challenging about it, or why it works, is that people accept ideas from, from those that they like. They reject ideas from people that they don't like, right? So, so the die is already cast, right, before someone opens their mouth in most situations. And I've ha had to deal, this was probably several years ago, with one person in particular who was just, he was an artful flatterer. And the funny thing is everyone knew that he was a flatterer. And it was so over the top, and it was almost endearing in some respect. But the irony is that it, it's actually, even if you know someone is flattering you, 
it's so hard to resist because you immediately, it's just human nature, you become like a dog who, if you start saying, you know, good boy, and you start petting the dog, the dog starts to smile and starts beaming. Like, that is how human beings are because we like to hear people talk, talk good about us. So not only do we need to learn to have, have a council of advisors, you can't expect everyone to just speak to you truthfully, right? That would be crazy. But you have to have a small group of people who you can come to for honest feedback. On the flip side, right, flattery is effective. So you might say, should I use flattery to get ahead? And I would say, here's, here's the, the way to, to kind of mine the kernel of truth in it, is that the, you can get the benefits of flattery without the drawbacks if you just simply and sincerely compliment people for things that, are, for things that they do well, for things that are true about them, for things that you like about them. And then it's sincere, it comes from the heart, and it will have the same benefit um, of flattery without any of the drawbacks. Number 29, almost done here. I have 31, 31 points because I'm 31 years old. So next, next year the group might get 32. Number 29, fortune favors the bold. One of my favorite quotes from Machiavelli, it is better to be impetuous than cautious. It is better to be impetuous than cautious. If that sounds... Um, scandalous. I actually think it's quite Aristotelian. Uh, you'll see Aristotle says, if you're aiming for the mean of courage, right, on one side you have the excess of rashness, on the other side you have timidity. And if, you, if you're trying to, if you're taking an arrow and you're trying to say, all right, I want to be a courageous person, the secret Aristotle lets you in on is that most people are timid by nature. Very few are just are headstrong and charge into things recklessly. So if you want to actually hit the nail on the head and be courageous, you actually need to aim towards being a little bit rash, and then you're going to land on being courageous. And I think you see this again with this thinking uh, a little bit bigger about fortune and providence. Uh, very, No one becomes great. It's always the people that are slightly rash, actually courageous, who end up kind of riding the wave of fortune, right? There are very few people who are just, if you're too timid, the wave of fortune will come and it's going to pass you by. Uh, so if you want to be great, you have to be bold. The answer is always no, unless you ask. You have to be assertive and take those risks. Number 30, challenges, challenges are a ladder to greatness. This is one of my favorite lines from Machiavelli. Without a doubt, princes become great when they overcome difficulties made for them and opposition made to them. So fortune, especially when she wants to make a new prince great, makes enemies arise for him and makes them undertake enterprises against him so that he has cause to overcome them and to climb higher on the ladder that his enemies have brought for him. Uh, I love that because it you know, what you'll find, and you, you probably find this, you know, in your college lives, what you'll find it in your job, at work, is that every week there are unforeseen things that have nothing to do with your own performance. Unforeseen bad things will happen, right? Uh, some of them are small, some of them are big, some of them are somewhere in between, and some of them happen Monday morning, some of them happen Friday evening, but like clockwork, I can't, every single week something happens. And so, with each, you, you should actually look forward to it with anticipation, knowing that each of these obstacles, uh, each of these chairs that are thrown in your path gives you an opportunity to learn a particular skill, to problem solve, to seek the, the counsel of your supervisor or maybe your mentor. And with each time that you remove that obstacle, you climb another rung up on the ladder. And it's always, it's a dress rehearsal for something greater that you'll do either in this life or in the kingdom of God to come. Finally, the last point, number 31, build an ecosystem. This is sort of my theory of everything, and this really gets back to the heart of Josh's talk last night, Tocquevillian associations. Right? Great and exciting things happen when you bring people together in community. Right? We might not know how to fix all of the problems that our country is going through, uh, but what we can do is bring together smart college students with uh, great uh, intellectual and academic minds uh, combined with our team here at ISI and also some of the other philanthropists that we have who have been 
very successful, whether it's in the world of business or the world of medicine, we can bring them together in a room to create that ecosystem out of which will emerge the ideas, the institutions, and the leaders that we need to turn this country around. And I'd say this in your own personal life, be a convening mechanism. You might not always be able to do it at the Ritz-Carlton, but you can do it in your own dorm room. And what I would say is like, take the initiative because like 90% of people will never actually reciprocate your own invitations. You hear this, I think, most often with parents and they're like, you know, I invited so-and-so to come over 10 times, but they've never invited me to come over their house, right? Most people don't reciprocate. It's just not in their nature to take the initiative. So you can't let that get you down. You just have to be the one who takes the initiative, it is, take, takes the lead on being hospitable, and great things will come. So in conclusion, we can no longer look to elite institutions and universities for our deliverance. If we want better leaders, we must train them we must train them ourselves, and we must become them ourselves. To become a great leader at the level of a Washington or a Hamilton requires a combination of character, charisma, cunning, and chance. And my hope is that even if you and if I don't become one of those great leaders, that each of us could become a good leader and take small steps each day to apply this wisdom to our own lives. I'll close with a quote from my Patron saint, John of Kronstadt, small things everywhere lead to great ones. Thank you. All right, we have got a few minutes for questions, if you'd like to yeah. come up to the microphone. Just a small thing. I think we missed 12 and 24. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Um, okay. I think those were the ones. Number 12. Oh, I actually didn't say number 12. There we go. Uh, re rewards incentivize good behavior. Um, so if you see someone doing something you like, you should compliment on, <laughs> compliment on them uh, or, or, you know, give them, some, you know, some, some actual kind of, you know, reward. And the more that you do that, the, you know, the, the more good behavior or ideal behavior you'll see in return. Cyrus the Great employed this tactic leading his battle campaigns, um, and he actually framed it in a slightly odd way, but it was, I thought it was interesting. He said that his men must be hunted with good words and good deeds. And I think the other one was 24. That 24. I, got it. I ended with 29 on my Ah, list, 24, so. okay. Uh, so this was generosity is profitable. Generosity is profitable. Um, so what Cyrus meant by that is he says, enriching and by enriching and benefiting human beings, I acquire goodwill and friendship, and from these harvest safety and glory. So for him, again, it was much more pragmatic. And he said to himself, I could hoard all the resources to myself. I'm the king. Or I could make those around me rich, prosperous, generous creators of their own wealth. And for him, it, it proved he ended up being far richer by making other people rich because then in his time of need, he was able to rely on them for their resources than by hoarding it all for himself. A Christian kind of reading of this would be when Christ says, uh, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or fields for my sake in the gospel will fail to receive a hundredfold more in the present age and in the age to come. As a conservative, I was deeply offended by number 29, I believe was the one. Uh, the whole better to be rash than cautious, because <laughs> I'm here because I'm cautious. Uh, <laughs> so I, 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 I guess this is halfway a question, halfway a comment. I like that better on a list of becoming a leader than what to do as a leader, because I see rashness when the risk is to yourself as admirable to some extent, when it is courageous, like you put it. But when you're a leader and the rashness has consequences for the entirety of what you lead, I find that to be deeply unconservative and uh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, w I would acknowledge, that, right, the point from Machiavelli is a bit tongue-in-cheek, right? Better to be impetuous than cautious. Um, 
and I kind of see what you're saying in the sense that like the stakes are certainly higher if you're the president than if you're a college student, you know, starting a ISI society. Uh, but I but I still think that the lesson I still think the lesson holds true. If, if you were to say, is it better to be courageous or cautious? I think the answer is always it's better to be courageous. And so if what it takes for you to be courageous is aiming that arrow a little bit past courage, uh, then I think that's the right thing. But if you're a rash, if you're a person who's prone to rashness and people around you, your friends have told you, like, look, you're forcing errors because you're constantly too aggressive, then of course you need to pull it back a bit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.